This is Science Friday. I'm Ira Plato. Did you take up birding during the pandemic? Yeah, you're not alone. Because during the year of staying at home, I will admit, watching the birds in my backyard feeders brought me some joy and comfort and even a sense of adventure. Just to let you know, I just filled my bird feeder a few months ago. Just to let you know, I just filled my bird feeder a few minutes ago. And that's true even as winter takes hold and the rest of the world slows down a bit, the birds always seem to have something going on, don't they? As we enter a new, hopefully better year, it is now the season to not just watch birds, but to count them. The National Audubon Society's annual Christmas bird count kicks off this week, the 121st year of a community science project that has spanned the country since 1900. Whether you're participating in the count, looking for identification help, getting some fresh air while social distancing, or just excitedly scanning the skies for finches and snowy owls this winter, we're here to talk about it all. So let's, let's start doing that. Joining me today to help, let's talk about who's joining us. Jeff LeBaron, director of the Christmas Bird Count. He's in Williamsburg, Massachusetts. Hi, welcome, Jeff. Hey, it's great to be on the program, Ira. Thank you very much. Nice to have you. Dudley Edmondson, an author, nature photographer, and yes, birder based in Duluth, Minnesota. Hi, Dudley. Let me unmute myself. Hello. Nice to be here. Nice to have you. And Joanna Wu, an avian ecologist for the Audubon Society. She joins us from San Francisco. Welcome. Hi, Ara. It's a pleasure to be here. Nice to have you. Just a quick note. This segment was recorded in front of a live Zoom audience. Find out about joining a future recording at sciencefriday.com slash live stream. Okay, let's, let's go right into this. For starters, I introduced you, but uh, I'd like you to introduce your local birds. So let's have a round robin, see what I did here, of the birds that are hanging out where you are right now. Dudley, kick us off here. Uh, you know, I, am, you know I, I pay a lot of attention to the birds in my backyard, like most people. Um, and birds I have are like chickadees and blue jays, uh, lots of cardinals, which is odd for northern Minnesota. Uh, but yeah, there's lots of woodpeckers and a few winter finches around. Hmm. And Joanna? Yeah, I have seen a robin recently, which was fun. Um, and here in San Francisco, we get a lot of wintering birds, and that's, that's really exciting as well. I took a walk uh, the other day over the weekend and saw gray-neck duck, bufflehead, even northern shoulder, which are birds we only see here in the winter. Um, and in my backyard, it's, it's been a pleasure to see such a colorful bird as a, the Townsend's warbler um, and California towhees, of course, white-crowned and golden-crowned sparrows. Nice, nice. Jeff, what have you seen? Well, we up until recently, we actually had a big flock of robins around, but they've eaten all the crab apples in the trees and moved on. We do have um, a lovely flock of cedar waxwings still here, sort of picking up the pieces that are left. Um, but mostly it's the, the chickadees, which I absolutely adore. They have more personality than just about any other bird. Um, and also some goldfinches and stuff like that. And we do have this flight of winter finches moving through as well, which is really exciting. Exciting. Jeff, as I mentioned, the annual Christmas bird count is more or less starting as we speak, right? What would this look like in a normal year? In a normal year, a lot of people would be going out and counting birds in their specific areas in their 15 mile diameter circles and then getting together uh, at the end of the day, probably for a compilation gathering and everybody talks about all the fun things that they saw and hopefully some exciting new or unusual things in the circle. Unfortunately, this year we can't do that uh, because of COVID. So um, we won't be having, people won't be having the compilation gatherings at the end of the day. And we are needing to minimize carpooling only with people who are pods or uh, family units. Um, and it's gonna be a lot more social distancing and masking. And I really do suspect that there'll be a much higher component of feeder watching this year on the Christmas bird count than we normally have. It's going to be a very, very interesting year for many, many reasons, and, and it could give us a lot of stuff to look at in terms of analyzing how this year turns out uh, in relation to the last 120 years. So it's, it's going to be very interesting. And Joanna, uh, and all of this counting gets you data, right? As an ecologist, what's so useful about knowing what birds people are seeing during any particular time of the year? 
Yeah, as Jeff said, this has been going on for over 120 years. The Christmas bird count is one of the longest standing data sets that we have available in science. It's incredible amount of information and it really helps us get at those long-term trends. For example, um, the National Audubon did a study looking at trends from the 1960s to the recent years and found that uh, birds on average have shifted northward for, in the century of their ranges about 40 miles, which is an incredible finding. Um, so data like that can help us get at, at um, trends like that. And also we can look at trends within each individual state for each species and, and look at how each species has been doing over that time period. So it's an incredible data set. And I thank all of you who have been collecting that to, to do so and to continue to do so via Christmas bird count, via eBird, we're using that information as well. Um, so keep up the good work. We can't do it without you. Yeah, good point. Uh, Jeff, this is a community science project. Uh, that means the data isn't gathered by people with scientific degrees necessarily. Does that matter? Is the, is the data still useful? The data is still extremely useful. The, the Christmas bird count is one of the two only, as uh, Joanna mentioned, it's one of the only two data sets that we have available to look at what's happening on a continental basis over time with the birds of, of North America particularly, but increasingly also in Latin America. Um, the, the, the reason that it doesn't, it isn't necessarily important for like trained ornithologists to be doing the Christmas bird count is because people go out in their own area and do the same thing in the same place every year with the same skill set in the same way. So there's a consistency of the way the uh, results are collected over time in each count circle and therefore we get really good trend data. Uh, which we can then compare with the breeding bird survey, which is the other survey that we use to look at summer data. And it really does give us this uh, amazing view into how birds are doing over time and also how they're shifting their ranges. Okay, let's go to our first question from the audience. Amy Wilkins has a question about how to accurately count birds. Hi, Ira. Thank you for taking my question. Hi, go uh, my ahead. Question my question is, how do you know you are not counting the same bird over and over again? You mean that the person who's doing the actual counting standing there, how do, how do we know they haven't counted the same bird twice? Is Correct. that what you're saying? Yes. Oh, good question. Uh, Jeff, you have an answer for that? Yes. Um, one of the, the Christmas bird count has a methodology to it in that the people who are out in the field are actually moving along a route. Um, and, you know, they have a specific route that they take during the course of the day. Um, and once they're done with their area and their route or routes, then they don't actually start keep counting birds. They don't, when they're driving through somebody else's area, they don't pirate the birds that they're seeing. Um, so at this time of year, the birds aren't really all that mobile. They're pretty much stationary. Um, so that we're pretty well assured that, you know, for most of the birds that we're counting, uh, by having these const you know, these routes that people are running, uh, we're not double counting species. The challenge in different methodology is with feeder watchers. Um, you don't want to keep counting chickadees or towhees that are coming into your feeder for the whole day because it's likely that then you will be double counting. So for feeder watchers, what we ask them to do is keep track of the amount of time that they're watching their feeders and only take the maximum number that they see of any see or hear of any given species at, at one time. So in that way, we're probably getting a little bit of undercounting, but we're not certainly getting overcounting or double counting. Wow, that's very interesting. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the trends we've learned about uh, from this data a little bit later. But first, Jeff, I want to ask you, where do we sign up if we're new to the Christmas bird count? On the Christmas bird count website itself, which is christmasbirdcount.org, um, you can also, you could try to find it through the Audubon system, but it's easiest just to type in christmasbirdcount.org and that will take you right to the CBC website. And one of the links that you can see when you scroll down below the big picture of the birders is uh, where it says join the CBC. And when you go there, there's actually a map that shows you all the expected circles that are active for this coming season. And when you click on a cir circle that you want to think about joining, there's the contact information for the compiler. Do you have to have really big expensive equipment to be a bird counter? No. Um, it's best if you have at least a pair of binoculars, but you don't need to have a spotting scope. You don't certainly don't need to have, you know, wonderful cameras like Dudley has. Um, and, you know, you just, it's just... 
um, anybody really with an, almost any skill set, um, and you know, even um, you know, impaired people in various ways are, are welcome to count because they they're almost everybody can contribute something on a Christmas bird count. Interesting. That's great to hear. Okay, time for another round robin. I have heard of this concept called a spark bird or a gate gateway bird as the bird that got you first interested in birds, right? Jeff, tell me what your gateway bird was. Probably, I sort of have two. I've been birding since I was a little kid. Um, the most dramatic one was a rose-breasted grosbeak. We used to, I used to live in, in Needham, Massachusetts, and we had some apple trees in the backyard. Um, and one day when I was about five years old, I was out under the apple tree and a chipmunk fell out of the tree. And I was like, oh, that's different. And I went in and I told my mother that the chipmunk had just fallen out of the tree. And she's like, you're nuts, kid. So we went out and pretty soon the chipmunk falls out of the tree again. And we looked a little bit further out and there's this adult male rose-breasted grosbeak further out the branch. Beyond him was the female sitting on the nest. And every time that chipmunk would climb the tree to go get, to go to get toward the nest, he'd knock the chipmunk out of the tree. So that was probably one of the, the certainly one of the first spark, spark birds that I had. I want that bird at my house. We have so many chipmunks <laughs> <laughs> wreaking havoc on stuff, havoc on stuff. Joanna, what was your uh, gateway bird? Yeah, I started birding more as a scientific experience after I took up an internship in college. So I, I didn't particularly have one gateway bird, but I think my biggest aha moment that summer was when we caught a flock of over 150 pine siskins in Northern California in the summer. And so we were just you know, in our mist nets, which we, we had permits for, we just had <laughs> so many pine siskins. It was just like extract, let them go, extract, let them go. Um, it was just an incredible experience. Wow, that must have been. And Dudley, tell us yours. Uh, you know, I should have mentioned earlier, I'm in Duluth, Minnesota now uh, on the shores of Lake Superior, but I grew up in Columbus, Ohio. And that's where my spark bird comes from. And it was Peregrine Falcon. Um, I remember actually in junior high school doing book reports on birds and birds of prey was one of those. And I remember reading about peregrines and I just really got hooked on raptors ever since then. And it's a lot it has to do with the speed. I mean, peregrines are crazy fast birds. And so that to me was just something that was just so exciting that this bird could fly, you know, over a hundred miles an hour, just crazy. I want to stay with your reference to Duluth because I want to talk about going out looking for birds this winter. Are the birds we're going to see, say in Duluth, going to be migrating from somewhere else or are they more likely to be permanent residents? I mean, what are they up to, Dudley? Yeah, you know, I'm on the Mississippi Flyway. Uh, and so my birds are coming from central Canada and heading south into Texas and things like that. So. Uh, you know, I mean, I have birds that are hanging around like chickadees and winter finches and things, but birds that are moving through, bald eagles, rough-legged hawks, uh, things like that are, are coming through. So, you know, all of the songbirds and smaller birds have, you know, passed through and they're probably already down in uh, Central and South America. But yeah, I mean, I'm getting a lot of what you would call typical feeder birds, cardinals and woodpeckers and chickadees and things like that. Joanna, what about San Francisco? I know you had your winter in August, so it's not exactly winter there now. What what are the birds coming or going from? Yeah, in winter we do get, in California in general, we get over 500 species, which is really unusual compared to other states of our latitude in the US. Um, so it's an incredible time to bird in winter in California. It's not even that cold as you, as you noted, it's just about 10 degrees colder than our summer. Um, in, in San Francisco, I should say. And so we do, as I mentioned, get a lot of water birds that come down from the Arctic to, to breed. After they breed there, they come down here and they spend their winters here. Um, one of my favorites is the Sanderling that breeds in the high Arctic and it winters along the coast. It's interesting because it really is gone like two, two and a half months of the year and it spends the rest of its time here. So it's not even accurate to call it winter. Um, bird it, birders sometimes call it a non-breeding range, and that's really what they're doing. They're spending their non-breeding time here. Uh, so I love seeing them when I go running on the beach, for example. And then we do get some birds like the hermit thrush and Townsend's warbler that come down in terms of songbirds. But of course, we have some that migrate south as well. So it's a little bit of a mix. 
And Jeff, what about if the Bee Gees were going to Massachusetts, what would they be seeing? Well, this year, actually, they would be seeing a rather amazing diversity of the winter finches. We've had both species of crossbills, both um, evening and pine grows beaks, especially pine grows beaks being unusual. And lots of siskins went through early and, and purple finches also. They had a big flight and they're way south of here for the most part now. What we have right now are mostly red crossbills and uh, sort of red poles floating around. Um, and then the sort of the regular wintering species, both both nut hatches that we have in the east, uh, red breasted and white breasted, and you know chickadees, black capped chickadees, and um, a few you know some flocks of robins and things. And we're actually more increasingly having wintering bluebirds, eastern bluebirds here also. So it's it's a nice diversity. Although I'm not on the coast, so I don't get to see some of the cool stuff that Joanna has. Um, so that that's most of what's here right now. If I may jump in with a quick note about uh, purple finches, one of my favorite ways to tell purple finches and house finches apart is by their vocalizations. Um, I almost can never tell them apart by looking at them, but the purple finch has a really spiraling and different call, or like a water, like a water, watery kind of call, whereas the house finch has a very distinct ending that goes upward. So. Um, I encourage new birders out there to try to learn some some songs of birds when they're trying to go out and 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 listen because a lot of times you don't get to see them when they're high up in the trees. But calls are a great way to to go about it. Joanna, that's a great segue to our our next question from someone in our audience. Delwyn Elder has a question about bird songs. Go ahead. Hello, and thank you for taking my call. Um, how do you, what's a good way to get started learning how to identify birds based on their bird song or calls? Joanna, you want to follow up with that? Yeah, um, the way I learned was basically by taking, you know, a, a phone or something, you can download the Audubon or Merlin app and they have bird songs in there. And I would suggest just going out, if you hear something, um, you can try to match it up in your phone and play the bird's song. Don't play it too loud. It might attract different birds in, but just try to kind of match it up in the field. I think that's the best way. Um, of course, you can practice at home, but it's always better to, to, to be hearing kind of the real bird in, in one ear and then your um, the bird call in the other. But Jeff and Dudley, if you have anything to suggest, please do. Yeah. Um, I remember way back in the day of CD-ROM and CDs and things, I, I actually learned my bird songs by bringing along a stack of whatever Audubon or someone who made CDs of bird songs. And I would stick them in my, uh, in my CD player as I was driving to go birding. And I would be listening the entire way, you know, and it may take an hour or so to get where I was going. And I would listen that way. And so I was constantly listening to bird songs, either on cassette or CD. And then I just learned them. And, and I still now, I learn them every season. I'll do a little refresher and listen. And, you know, so that by the time birds are, are back in the area, I, I, I know a red, American Red start from a murder warbler or something like that, so. The other thing. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm right, sorry. I just the other thing that's really I find really <laughs> helpful, um, and I mention this to people. It's you know you 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 can familiarize yourself with all the recordings and and you know apps and that kind of stuff. But to really cement the song to the bird, if you can find if you hear something that you don't know what it is, you go find the bird and actually watch the bird sing that song. That that'll really cement it for you. And that's I mean. Uh, it's amazing to have all these resources, but just that visual and, and audio image in your brain at the, sa at the same time really cements it. You know, I went out in my backyard near my bird feeder last summer, and uh, I mean, not the COVID summer, but I was trying to learn some of the songs, and I took out my cell phone with bird, so bird sound songs on them, and I started playing them. I was started to play the song of a, a cardinal, and a cardinal came down and dive bombed my head. <laughs> I guess I was playing the right song. I mean, what was that about? It's a it's a territorial reaction that birds have when they hear their own. Uh, uh, it's like they, all of a sudden there's an intruder, a name, you know, a new intruder in their territory. So if if another if another somebody else is singing my song, I have to go 
push them out because this is my territory. So that's that's generally what causes that. It was that was uh, life changing for a while. Yeah. <laughs> Very interesting, uh, Joanna. I want to talk about the the downside because I know you're specifically researching how climate change may be affecting how bird ranges change. Can you fill us in on a bit about what you're learning? Yeah, yeah. So a lot of my work at Audubon has been looking at climate projections and we're seeing, hey, like we know from the, the big 3 million birds paper that was published earlier, um, that birds are declining. But looking forward, how what can we predict about where birds might be in the future? So some of our work has been relating where birds are currently and we use a ton of community science collected data for, for that purpose. Um, and then we take variables such as um, precipitation, minimum and maximum temperature. We even looked at um, land use change projections and we made predictions about where these birds might range in the future. So for example, the dark eye junco is projected to move northward if, it's, if it is to track its current climate conditions. Um, the California quail, our state bird, is also projected to move northward and, and largely out of California, unfortunately. Um, so a lot of birds will have to adapt to new conditions. And if, if, they, if they can adapt, they may be able to stay in place and kind of go against some of our predictions. But um, science has found that birds do a mix of things. Some of them do track their climatic, we call it their, their climatic niche. And some are able to exploit new niches and kind of stay in place, particularly their urban adapted species and the generalist. Um, so that's the kind of work we've been looking at. You know, we've been hearing that the Arctic regions are the fastest changing regions in the world. Are there Arctic birds that are being affected by this? Yeah, unfortunately, the Arctic species are the ones we found to be the hardest hit by climate change. Um, all 100% of our 16 Arctic species that we modeled are expected to have high vulnerability to future climate change. For example, the emperor goose, which has nowhere to go, it can't move northward, um, is projected to lose all of its range unless it can adapt very fast, which not all birds can do, but many birds can't. Um, so yeah, the Arctic and the boreal zones are, are definitely areas to watch for and try to conserve as much as we can. Uh, on the other hand, is anyone doing well as the climate changes? Yeah, um, urban species are doing really well, much and that might be more to hum because they're adapted to human habitats than climate itself. Um, and then our findings that arrowland species, species adapted to hotter and drier climates are not as threatened by climate change, um, especially a lot of areas in the West are projected to get more arid in the future. So they might benefit a little bit. And then in the winter, a lot of species are, are going to be pretty stable or see improving climate conditions because we're projected to have a lot milder winters across the US. So um, in summer, birds might take more of a hit across North America, but in winter, uh, projections are generally more positive. Interesting. Uh, uh, Jeff, how is the Christmas bird count data helping us observe these kinds of changes? Can you see trends like this from the data? Absolutely. Uh, we did use the earlier study that Joanna mentioned in terms of tracking the, the center of abundance of species was pretty much a completely Christmas bird count data set for 60 years uh, from the mid from the 1950s to the then present in 2006. And we were able to document the species changing their ranges over that, you know, 60 or so years. And we had the exact also climatic conditions that were moderating and changing so we could document with the Christmas bird count how species are adapting and changing with a changing climate. Um, and what that's what the you know the, the new predictions the, the the modeling for the future took those information the documentation of how the species are changing their ranges uh, as the winter moderates um, and then uh, sort of looking at their climate space where it's going to go in the future. Um, but we also, there's a, the trend viewer, which is a, a, a new feature that we have on the Christmas bird count website, where you can actually choose your area and actually look at how a whole host of species, we've got like 500 that are modeled there, are doing within your area uh, over various different periods of time. D Dudley, as a seasoned bird watcher, can you tell anecdotally, you know, how the birds are changing in your region over time? Can you see something dramatic going on and say, hey, I could see something happening here? 
Yeah, no doubt. I mean, I've been keeping records, data, my own little citizen science thing going on here at my property for 30 years. And I can tell you, I didn't have cardinals in my yard any time of the year, you know, 20, 25 years ago. I have cardinals in my yard in the all winter now. And I'm 180 miles south of the Canadian border. It just doesn't make sense to me. I've got red belly woodpeckers all winter. None of that makes sense. What I should have is evening and pine grosbeaks, uh, common red poles, uh, juncos, uh, things like that. And those birds are few and far between when winter really sets in. Uh, and so I used to have hordes of red poles. I mean, hundreds of common red poles have come to my feeders and they don't anymore. And it's, it's very sad. In case you just joined us, you're listening to uh, Jeff LeBaron, Dudley Edmondson, and Joanna Wu talking about birds on the Audubon Christmas Bird Count Show. I'm Ira Flato. This is Science Friday from WNYC Studios. Let's continue. Um, John Salisbury, I understand, has a question about birds in the Southwest. Let's go to John. Hi, John. Welcome. <laughs> We had a major uh, die off of migratory birds in the Southwest this year. And I was intrigued by the conversation about climate change and whether, you know, I have my own theories as to why it happened. Um, definitely weather, we're in a ma major drought in the Southwest of Colorado, or in Colorado, but the entire nation is in a major, major drought and how um, it's really affecting these migratory birds. So interested to see what you guys think about that. Who wants to answer that question? I can jump in if you want, because I've yeah, actually for it. followed this quite closely because I used to live in New Mexico. Um, and the majority of the birds that were affected in that huge die off were what we call aerial insectivores and migratory aerial insectivores. Um, so there was a, it, it appears that there was a combination of things that, that came together for that sort of catastrophic, catastrophic event for those migrants. Um, many of them normally would breed further north and west, where they may have been pushed out early because of the, of the smoke from all the fires in the, on the west coast and Pacific Northwest. So if they had to leave early and were slightly under condition, they were already stressed during migration. And what happened at that point was that you had that record heat. Um, I think it was 90 something in Denver on one day and down in the 20s the next day. And that actually, it, it, it basically caused them to, they were, you know, it was such a shock to them and there were no insects for them to eat that that's probably what caused the, the primary uh, mortality. Most of the um, local residents, even migratory birds, weren't as badly affected. It was really these, these longer distance aerial insectivores. Interesting. I know Mario Alonso has a question. So we're going to go to Mario next with a question about owl migrations. Hi, Mario. Welcome to Science Friday. Hi, thank you for taking my call. Uh, I live in Cincinnati, Ohio, and we have a, a very beautiful park right behind our house called Old Park. <clears throat> and every year we see Barred owls, usually a pair of barred owls, and sometimes we see owlets there. I've taken many pictures of them. But I've noticed that during the months between November and January, I never see the owls. Uh, so my question is, are they migratory, or is it uh, behaviorally they're changing what they're doing, and, and I don't see it? Dudley, you're originally from Ohio, right? Yeah. Um, you know, it's hard to say. Uh, I recall, I'm, as I mentioned, I'm from Columbus, and I do recall seeing owls, particularly like short-eared owls. There's an area uh, north of Columbus, um, I think it's like Little Sandusky or something like that, but the, the habitat there was really good for uh, wintering owls, uh, again, like short-eared, occasional snowy and things like that. Uh, but as far as urban owls, I really don't recall, you know, any, any being around. Anyone else have a clue on the barred owls being migratory? The, the barred owls, we have a lot of barred owls around here in New England, um, and they're, they become sort of the most common breeding larger owl. Um, it used to be the great horn, but the great horn numbers went down after um, West Nile virus. Um, 
With the barred owls, what, what seems to happen is, um, yes, they do change their behavior. If they're actually nesting in the park there, uh, what will happen is that once the, the young have fledged, then they'll disperse out and around. What we see here sometimes in, in the Northeast is when there's been a really good year where lots and lots of barred owls are produced, you know, if, it's a, if, if there are lots of small rodents from the season before, um, then we, we actually do get a, a post-breeding dispersal movement. Um, and it's mostly the young birds that are moving. Um, they're not a really migratory species. Um, barred owls aren't, but, um, but they, there certainly is some dispersal and movement during the winter. So it's a combination of those two things that you're probably seeing there. Joanna, I understand that you have a project, a group called Galbatrosses, where you specialize in identifying female birds. Why is this so important for science, Joanna? Yeah, thanks for asking. Uh, so male birds have kind of dominated the birding world, partially because they're, when they're more flashy, they're brighter. And in a lot of the species, males sing the majority of songs, although we're, we're finding more and more that female birds do sing as well. Um, but that has actually led to a lot of conservation implications by overlooking female birds. Um, for example, one research one researcher found that the golden-winged warbler actually has sexually segregated habitat use in winter, um, meaning that females winter at kind of a lower elevation habitat in, in the neotropics, whereas males use higher elevation, more intact forests. Um, so the when logging happens, it tends to hit those lower elevations first, just because it's easier to access. And so they're finding that females have lost more of their species, um, more, more females have been lost over a period of time than males in the same, same general region. And so this is one of the conservation implications of overlooking females. When you lump the males and females together in a study, you might lose some of the details and the nuances when females use different habitats than males. Um, so, you know, ornithology, even the, whether it's the science or the bird watching, started in the 1800s largely with, with a lot of kind of a male biased clubs and, and some of those, some of those um, you know, white centric policies still uh, affect us today. And, and so one of the amazing things about bringing more diverse voices to ornithology and birding is that it diversifies the types of questions we're asked that, that are asked and it makes our science stronger. That's an interesting point. Let me go to uh, the last couple of questions I have. And let me shoot the first one at you, Dudley. I mean, we have all these travel restrictions and more people gaining an interest in birding. I think more of us are looking at birds in our, our backyard like I do than ever before. How do we make the most of a small space when it's hard to travel to specific birding hotspots? Yeah, I mean, birds really don't need a lot. They need food, shelter. This time of year, they need water. Uh, having a water feature, a, 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 a heated bird bath is a really good way to bring birds to your yard. I mean, I've seen in the winter, I've seen everything from sharp shin hawks to foxes coming in to my uh, bird bath. So uh, having, having food and shelter, you know, maybe piling up some brush or leaf matter, uh, and then definitely having a heated bird bath is a really good way to bring birds to your yard. Let me go to our next uh, listener, Carol Butens. I know Carol has a question about identifying bird songs. I guess we'll amplify in what we said before. Hi, Carol. Welcome to Science Friday. Well, she said she'd like to learn more about bird songs, and she loves the Cornell.edu website. Are there other good resources online? What do you What do you think about that, Jeff? Well, the actually, I mean. Yes, I work for Audubon, but the, we, the Audubon has a free birding app, which has a, an amazing variety of bird vocalizations in with the species. So that's one really easy place to go. Um, and you can do that through the Audubon website as well. Um, in addition to the Laboratory of Ornithology's website, which is absolutely wonderful, um, if, you wanna, if you're really interested in all the different kinds of vocalizations that a given bird can make, there's a website called Zeno Canto. It's X-E-N-O hyphen C-A-N-T-O. Um, and it's probably the largest library of bird sounds that I know um, out there. Um, so that's, that's another good resource if you, you know, you think you heard a, a, a wren or, or a cardinal, um, you know, to go and listen to all the different kinds of noises that they can make. 
Dudley, I want to ask you this because I know you're a professional nature photographer and I know some people love to take photos of anything. Um, do we have to have fancy lenses, big cameras? What's advice coming from you for trying your hand at bird photography? You know, it's amazing how smartphones have gotten really good at uh, taking pictures and there's, there's uh, different uh, things you can get to put on a spotting scope, but even really the, the megapixel count of, of a lot of cell phones is high enough that you probably could get a distant picture of a bird and then sort of, you know, pixel peep on it and zoom in on it. So, uh, you know, certainly start with your, your phone, the camera that you own. Good, good advice. Uh, Joanna, Jeff, do you have any last minute advice for new birders or folks that just want to stretch their skills this year? Joanna? No, um, just thank you for being here and try to use eBird if you can. Um, it's a great community science data collection app and we do extract eBird data every month and use that in our scientific analysis. So you're also contributing to research. Well, let me ask one last round robin question because I know 2020 has been a harder year for us going out chasing favorite species. So let me begin by asking, as we enter a new year, what are the birds that you're most hoping to see in, in 2021? And Jeff, you can start. <laughs> what are the can, birds I'm most wanting to see in 2021? Yeah, what um, would, would you, is there something missing or something that would confirm a trend? What would you go out looking for? I would hope to continue to sort of follow this winter finch invasion. Uh, the evening grosbeaks that we've had moving through in flocks this year in the east, it's the first time in decades that actually they've been moving in those kinds of numbers. So it's going to be really interesting to track those birds because they're all the way down into, in some instances, even the panhandle of Florida, I think now, um, to sort of track them as, I'll be looking forward to seeing them as they come back through. But honestly, it's like when people ask me, what's my favorite bird? It's whatever I'm looking at at the time. So my, oftentimes the bird I look forward to most is the first bird that I'll get on January 1st. Uh, that's a very political, correct answer. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Joanna, what, what will you be looking for? Well, the, my nemesis bird or a bird that I keep trying to see is the California condor. It is got one of the, maybe it has the largest wingspan in the U.S. And um, I have gone out a few times to try to look for it, but they're just so uncommon. They're back, they're pretty endangered, um, but they're recovering. And so I'm going to try to go down to Pinnacles National Park again and try to look for them also because it's a great place to hike. Anyone else want to chip in with what they'd be looking for? Yeah, I three-toed woodpecker for me is mm -hmm. is a bird that kind of a nemesis bird. I mean, I looked for it last year multiple times. People would say, hey, it's over here. Give me the directions. I get there. I never saw the bird. And that happened to me at least three times. So I'll continue to look for three-toed woodpecker. All right, Dudley, you're going to have the last words today. Uh, I want to thank all of you for taking time for us today. Joanna Wu, an avian ecologist, for the National Audubon Society, Dudley Edmondson, author and wildlife photographer and avid birder, Jeff LeBaron, director of the Audubon Society's annual Christmas bird count. Thank you all for joining us today. A, veri a veritable flock, a veritable flock of birders. See, what it, yeah, it was not very good, no. I think that will be my last dad joke <laughs> the first <laughs> uh, for, for 2020. Thank you all for Thank taking you. time to be with us today. Thank you, Ira. Thank you, Thanks, Ira. Ira. Appreciate it. And we and, and and I want to thank our Zoom audience. Thank you all out there in Zoom land for joining us for this recording. It's great to have you. Charles I Burke. Wanna, was, I want to thank everybody that does Christmas bird counts too, because without you, we wouldn't it wouldn't be we wouldn't have the database we have. So it's wonderful. There you have it. Charles Burke is our director. Our producers are Alexa Lim, Christy Taylor, Katie Feather, and Kathleen Davis. B.J. Liederman composed our theme music. And on the Science Friday Vox Pop app, we have a question for you. What questions do you have about COVID-19 vaccines? Please share them with us. We're going to tackle that topic on a future show coming right up. So we'd like to know what questions do you have about COVID-19 vaccines? That's on the Science Friday Vox Pop app, wherever you get your apps. Wishing everybody a happy and safe new year. I'm Ira Flato. We'll see you next week.